So basically what um, we want to look at tonight is the difference between crime and family law. Um, there are two very, very different strands of law. But sometimes, and these are the sorts of cases that Joe um, is going to talk to you in detail about next week, sometimes you have one set of facts for a family that are dealt with in the criminal courts and also dealt with in the family courts. And you will often have seen in the newspapers um, stories about... You, you see more often stories about what happens in the criminal courts because they're open courts than you see of what's happening in the family courts. And there are reasons for that that I'll, I'll touch on this evening. Um, I understand, for those of you who, who have come previously, that Joe has done a lecture on the difference between private family law and public family law. But just for those of you who weren't at that lecture, the difference, um, we, we have um, a number of strands of family law we leave off to one side money um, to do with divorce. That, that's not the kind of law that myself and Joe are involved in. We deal only with law relating to children. And within children's law, there's a difference between private law and public law. Private law is where you have a mum and a dad, private individuals fighting over issues to do with their children. Public law, as it suggests that it, in its name, is where the state, usually a local authority, is taking issue um, with uh, the way that a parent is parenting its child. So it's public law cases that we're dealing with tonight and not private law cases. Um, jo has um, suggested in her um, that, that there is a warning that comes with these cases, and that is that um, some of the content of the cases, and certainly in the handout that you can get at the end, there is a huge amount of detail in the cases that some people might find disturbing. A, a lot of medical evidence and a lot of detail about what happened to children, which some people most certainly would find very distressing and which family lawyers and judges aren't immune and we do find distressing at times, but um, somebody has to deal with them. It's kind of like a, a doctor dealing with um, sick people. We have to deal with children who are at risk of um, injury or who have been injured. So when you're reading through the detail of the cases, you might want to bear that in mind. And if you're of a squeamish nature, don't read the details that are in the handout. And I'm not going to go through uh, the more um, graphic of the details because uh, I, I don't need to, to make the points. So um, you see, the first thing we're going to look at is the difference between the two courts. If you think in your head about the um, family courts and the criminal courts, the most famous criminal court is the Old Bailey. Um, that's, it only deals with crime. You wouldn't see anything to do with family law happening in there. It's the equivalent of a Crown Court, so Wood Green Crown Court, um, Stafford Crown Court. Those are all criminal courts, and they deal with criminal cases. Uh, and the sort of cases that we're talking about are quite serious cases, so they're only dealt with at um, Crown Court level. Um, the family courts are spotted all over um, each city. So here we have a central family court in Holborn, which has, I think, about 30 courts in it, dealing with five or six cases a day in each of those courts, and that's just one court. Most local areas have got family courts as well, dealt with in the county courts and in the magistrates' courts, but by specialist family judges. Um, just looking at um, who might deal with the areas of um, difficulty that families get into. We have coroner's courts who deal obviously with children who are dead um, and where there isn't going to be an investigation in the criminal court or the um, family court, it's often only dealt with in the coroner's court. And the coroner deals with the cases when there is an unexplained or sudden uh, death. But there is sometimes, very often, an overlap. If you have an unexplained death in a child, then the coroner's court will, be, uh, will have to deal with it at some point. Um, you then have the um, Crown Court, which I've just uh, explained is the criminal court dealing with um, deaths of children where a there is a strong suspicion or strong evidence that a criminal offence has been um, caused, whether that is murder, um, grievous bodily harm, assault, 
uh, those are the sort of crimes that a Crown Court might deal with. And then you've got the Family Court. Um, the, there is a significant difference between Family Courts and um, Criminal Courts in terms of the burden of proof. Now, what is the burden of proof? That is that whoever makes an allegation has the burden of proof on them to show that what they are saying somebody has done, they actually have done. So um, that is a different thing to the standard of proof, uh, which I, I'll come on to deal with the difference between criminal courts and family courts in terms of the standard of proof. But in terms of the burden of proof, who has to prove the case? Who proves the allegation that they make? Um, that is, the, in the case of a family court, it's the state in the, a local authority. They will be the ones making the allegations and the burden of proof is on them. And then the, um, in the Crown Court, it's the CPS, again, the state. So the, the burden of proof, who has to prove what, what they say has happened, um, is, is either the state and family courts or the, um, the local authority in, in uh, the state. Whether it's the family court or the Crown Court, it's the state. But if it's the family court, it's a local authority. If it's a Crown Court, then it's the CPS. The standard of proof, then, is very different between the two courts. And, and that plays a very important part in tonight's lecture. The, <coughs> the standard of proof in the criminal court is way higher than it is in the family court. And I'll come on to deal with the reasons why that is. But the, in terms of what standard you have in the criminal court, that is basically 99% sure you'll have heard the term proof beyond a reasonable doubt. That only applies in the criminal court. In the um, family court, it's the balance of probability. So whereas in a, in a criminal court, you have to think of it in terms of you need to be 99% sure that somebody has done what's alleged against them in order to convict somebody. In the family court, it's way lower, and it's a, 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 just more likely than not. So you're talking more like 51% sure that something has happened. Um, so th that is a very significant difference between the two courts, and, and there are other differences uh, that we, we'll um, come on to. The, um, I've just dealt with the first point there that the burden of proof is on the CPS in crime and it's on the local authority in family law. The standard of proof, I've just um, said, if, 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 you're, if you've ever sat on a jury, you'll have been told by a judge that you must be satisfied so you are sure. And that is why a lot of the time if you sit in a criminal court, as a, as an onlooker and not really address your mind to being sure you have a feeling that the person is guilty, um, you won't necessarily get a conviction because you need to be sure, 99% sure, that, that um, somebody has done what's alleged against them. In the family court, much lower. So when you look at why do we have criminal proceedings, why do we have care proceedings, the care proceedings are the family proceedings and um, the criminal proceedings relate to criminal offences. They have different purposes really, so that when you, when you look at um, the purpose of criminal proceedings, it is to punish um, somebody for doing something and they'll be punished by imprisonment, fines, community sentences, but the, the, the first point is to punish. The other point is to deter somebody from doing something again and deter others from doing the same thing as that person is convicted of. In care proceedings, the purpose is very, very different. The purpose and only purpose in care proceedings is to protect a child who's been injured or to protect a sibling of a child who's been injured or another child who might be injured if you don't do something um, it, when a set of circumstances comes to your attention. So there are very different agendas between a criminal court and a, um, a family court. Um, looking at uh, what you have to, uh, what a jury has to look at, has the defendant committed a criminal offence against the victim? Um, the outcome therefore relates only to the adult. 
it may matter to a victim, but the outcome really is, is, is very adult specific and it's very defendant oriented. Uh, and the result will be, as I say, either uh, an acquittal, a conviction, um, or, and therefore either punishment or freedom. In family, you're asking the question, was the child or were the children, have they suffered serious harm? And then going on, if they have suffered serious harm, is there a, a risk that there will be significant further harm either to that child or another child? And the outcome here is based on the child. It's focused completely on the child, not really interested in the consequences for the adults involved, but you want to focus on the welfare of the child, which is in every set of care proceedings the court's uh, paramount consideration. Um, looking then at um, the legal basis for uh, a trial, um, a criminal trial only happens when there's been an unlawful act, a, cr a criminal act. Um, I, give, I give you a couple of examples there. You may have somebody who uh, beats a child with a belt. Um, that's not allowed, and it doesn't matter in in this jurisdiction, it doesn't matter whether that's acceptable in any other jurisdiction, although there are um, fewer and fewer jurisdictions where that is acceptable. When you're here, beating a child with a belt is unacceptable and is a criminal offence. Um, equally, uh, you'll have heard reports of, for example, um, shaking babies causing death. And there was a time, I think about 20 years ago, when people weren't widely aware that shaking a baby can cause death. Um, I can recall representing a very young father who was an adoring father, 19-year-old Scottish boy, and he was delighted to his 16-year-old girlfriend had given birth, and he really was, on all the evidence, an absolutely lovely boy, and delighted to be a young father, but he smoked cannabis at night. And when the baby woke up at night, he wasn't, he'd stay up smoking cannabis at 2 o'clock in the morning, he'd go to bed, and when the baby woke at 4, he'd be cross. Um, and one night, unfortunately, he got up and shook the baby to try and get the baby to go back to sleep. And in those days, people weren't as aware 20 years ago as they are now that shaking a baby can cause devastating injury. So in that case, um, he was charged when he shook the baby and she became effective. She was paralysed and close to death and um, didn't recover. Um, he was charged with grievous bodily harm and he pleaded guilty to that criminal offence but then there were also care proceedings where he accepted what he had done and wanted the child to come back to him after he got out of prison but in the end the child was adopted and was so disabled that needed um, specialist 24-hour care. So that's the sort of um, overlap that you can come across is a, a criminal offence being committed and then care proceedings. In that case, it was straightforward because he was accepting uh, what he had done. So um, in that sort of case, you have serious harm, which must trigger um, care proceedings in relation to that living child. And also there was an older child living in the house who also um, was uh, taken away from those parents. Um, looking then at... Um, the next uh, section, what is the standard of proof? Um, I've sort of I've touched on that already, taking it slightly out of order. 99% in criminal case, beyond a reasonable doubt. 51% um, balance of probability. And you see there, um, Joe sets out the reasoning behind that is that when it comes to a criminal offence, you'll remember that the potential punishment there for a serious offence is imprisonment for a very long time. And the, the British um, justice system and many other justice systems in the world is, are of the view, or is of the view, that it's better that some guilty people go free than innocent people um, go to prison. And if you look at what happens in America, for example, that's not the same approach. Um, although technically they have the same system, it's a very different um, approach to justice and you end up with a lot more people who um, are in prison who shouldn't be and haven't done anything. So we take the view here that unless somebody is proved guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, they shouldn't, um, they, they shouldn't go to prison. But as I said to you, the agenda in the family court is different. So you may be acquitted, and um, Joe will be talking to you about a couple of cases where in the criminal court, um, parents were acquitted, not guilty, 
um, by a jury, but that was at that higher 99% standard. That doesn't mean that you don't end up going to the family court and the, a family judge looking at it again and possibly finding that actually you did it. Um, so, and the reason for that is that the courts, the family courts, would rather err on the side of caution and not take a risk on handing back a child to a family where the same thing or worse could happen again. So you're looking at, they, they have a different agenda. They're looking at risk and they're looking at child protection. Nothing to do with punishment, just protecting a child or any other um, children in, in the home from that. Um, Looking then, where do we hear the cases? I've given you an idea of the kind of courts um, that, that you hear about, um, the Old Bailey being crime and uh, crown courts generally. Um, if you, um, Joe wanted to sort of point out the difference between the criminal court, the um, Kavanagh QC is a criminal lawyer. You'll remember they wear um, a rumple of the Bailey they wear um, gowns, wigs, um, bands, uh, and it's all quite 18th century. In the family court, we wear suits and um, not very interesting ones. Navy, black, dark grey at a push. That's it. So it's a uniform, but it's the, the reasoning behind that is that we're not supposed to be as intimidating as criminal lawyers. I don't know whether it works or not, but um, we, we're not allowed to wear robes unless occasionally, I mean, in the Court of Appeal, you have to wear your robes, um, and we do all have them. We just, um, they get extra dusty because we don't use them that much. Um, and they do make your head itch amazingly because they're made of horse hair. So when you wear them, um, they make your head very itchy. Uh, as Joe says, in most of the family courts, it's more like an office. It's like a big office, and we're all on the same level. In the high court, it's different. In the family division, it, it, it's a bit different. But in criminal court, you have a jury box, you have a dock, and it's a, a different setup. It's a much uh, it, there's there's a very different atmosphere there. Um, who decides the case is an interesting and very different question, because in crime you have a jury, or magistrates for much less serious crimes. In family, you have a judge. And what is very interesting, when I did crime, I had a completely 100% acquittal record um, for my clients because I found juries were amazingly gullible, really, or giving people the benefit of the doubt because there were some who I know must have done what they were accused of, and I was able to get them acquittals, having told them they should plead guilty because the evidence was very strong. But I got all of them were acquittals. I then moved into family law, having done a few years of crime, and I remember being shocked at how you couldn't make any what are called jury points. So you couldn't try something because the judge had heard it all before and was looking at it completely differently to how a jury looks at it. So juries will give everybody the benefit of the doubt and judges hardly ever will. So you're, as an advocate, you have to be you approach judges very differently to how you'd approach a jury. And there are, there's no point in being emotional or trying to appeal uh, to their emotions because they look at it much more forensically and much more uh, clinically. Um, the um, family court is looking at different questions. The criminal court says guilty or not guilty. Did they do it or not? In a family court, it's what's happened to the child? Who did it? Who might have done it? Is it these people? Is it somebody else? Who poses a risk to the child on, in, in the future? So you're looking at the past and deciding what's going to happen in the future. Different in crime. In crime, you're looking at what happened in the past, full stop, deciding what happened, and that's the end of the case. In this one, you're looking to the future. Um, where can the child live? So if they can't go back to their parents, what's going to happen to them? Adoption, foster care, living with a relative. Those are all options, so you're planning for the future in a way that you don't have to bother doing in a, a criminal case. And you're looking at a much broader canvas than in a criminal case, and therefore, as, as I'll come on to, the rules of evidence are different. Um, the parties in the case, so I've said that in the criminal court, it's the Crown represented through the CPS. In the family court, it's the local authority against respondents. And the possible respondents in care proceedings 
automatically anybody with parental responsibility is a respondent. So they, they, even if they're not in the frame, as it were, for whatever it is you're looking at, even if it's obvious that they haven't done anything, they will still be respondents because they have a significant interest in the outcome for their child. Um, also, the child is a respondent and they have their own legal team. So they're represented, so you've got a one-year-old clearly the one-year-old can't give instructions, so they're represented through a children's guardian who's usually a social worker um, coming from an organisation called CAFCAS, the Children Advice, uh, Advisory Family Service. They are dedicated only doing court work and they are looking at representing children in an objective, child-focused way and they have their own lawyer because the stakes are high in all of these care, care cases. More, more often than not, it is a real option that the child is going to be removed from the family forever. So the stakes are high and the child's voice has to be heard and that is a, a, an increasing uh, trend. That's always been the case in care proceedings, but in all children proceedings now, there is a trend towards um, children being separately represented, even in private law proceedings. Um, and the older a child is, the more chance they have of having their own representation separately, so it, separately to the children's guardian. The children's guardian usually represents younger children. As a child gets older, if they say you have a teenager, 14, who's at risk, um, guardian is saying really they should stay in foster care or go to a residential unit, and the teenager is saying, I don't want to have anything to do with that, I want to go home, then they will split away from their guardian, the guardian will be left on their own saying to the court, this is what I think is in his or her best interest, and the teenager can say, do you know what, I want to go home. So you, you can have a, an older child separately represented to their guardian. And then in addition to that, where you've got um, other adults or adult children in the frame, they, they can, with the permission of the court, become respondents as interveners because, say for example, in a sex abuse case, you have a 19-year-old in the home who might be a perpetrator of sexual abuse on a five-year-old sibling or half-sibling. That person would not be automatically a respondent, but if, the, say, the father is having allegations made against him and he says, it wasn't me, it definitely wasn't me, and the child says, no, it wasn't him, it was my brother, then that brother is going to want to be involved because as a matter of fairness, you can't have allegations and um, facts found against somebody without them knowing and having the chance to defend themselves. So um, you will, in uh, family court, have, um, as I say, automatically parents, then children, and other adults who might be in the frame who, who can join um, with the permission of the court. Um, <coughs> lawyers, uh, you've got um, in the Crown Court the outfit there and in the um, other courts, as I said, we've got business suits. Who can hear what's happening in court? Very different. In the um, criminal courts, you can basically, everybody can go into the criminal court. And that's the same whether it's the lower court in the Crown Court or in the magistrates or in the uh, Court of Appeal. In the family court, on the other hand, it's only accredited press representatives, and that's only for the past few years that they've been allowed into court. But it's on the basis that although, and you wouldn't necessarily know it, there was great excitement um, when the press were allowed in. They had been asking to come in for a very long time, and you, the Daily Mail in particular, wanted to report uh, how we were all doing terrible secret things in the secret courts, in the family courts. And they came for the first week that they were allowed in and they discovered that because they couldn't name people and they couldn't name the children, somehow it wasn't that interesting. So although they're all allowed in, it's very rarely now that we have press um, in court. Um, and in the high court where I do most of my work, there's one press association guy and he comes around and he asks, is there anything interesting? And if you don't tell him what you're doing or you say it's not interesting, he, he doesn't really hang around that much longer. He goes on to another court to see if he can find someone who'll admit that their case is interesting. Um, but having said that, he, he does pick up on um, the, the new uh, trend of the current president of the family division is towards transparency because of all those, uh, we say, unfair reports about what we were doing in the family court. The trend now is to show much more of what's going on as long as we protect the identity of the children, and that usually means um, the identity of the parents as well. But without names, apparently, the press aren't as interested 
in a story as they are with names, and that's because we as readers aren't as interested if we don't get names and um, areas, and that's what they're not allowed to do because it's a contempt of court for them to give details of a family case that might lead to the identity of the child becoming known. Uh, obviously, journalists don't want to be in that position. Um, you can see there, uh, section 97 um, is the, the um, criminal offence if you report things that you're um, not allowed to report. What evidence is heard? Again, very different between the criminal court and the family court. In the criminal court, the rules of evidence are very strict, and that's again because it's the liberty of the subject. It's the um, whether somebody's going to go to prison or not. So there are very strict rules. Um, you're not allowed hearsay except in very certain circumstances. Um, whereas in the family court, hearsay is allowed. And again, when I first went to family law, I couldn't believe how it seemed very lax that you could say things or you could report things that someone else had said to the judge. Whereas in the criminal court, that's simply not allowed to go before a jury because it's considered prejudicial and unreliable. Whereas judges are considered to be able to weigh in their own minds what is likely to be true and how much weight they can put on hearsay evidence. And hearsay is obviously, as you probably all know, something that is not coming directly from somebody who witnessed something, but rather they were told something by somebody else. So it becomes unreliable. And when you, it goes, somebody told someone who told someone who told someone, the further down the line you go, the less reliable it comes. And you know that yourself. If someone tells you a story and then you repeat it, and you might not know quite that you got the right details, and then the person who you told tells someone else. And by the time it's fourth hand hearsay, you have a different story to what actually was reported in the first place. And it's because of that that um, hearsay is not allowed in the criminal courts. The reason it's allowed in the family court is that judges need to know what might be true or not. Um, and then they are given uh, credit for knowing how much weight to attach to that. And they look at you know, corroboration to see what else overall they can add together. Um, to look at how reliable or not some evidence is. But it is a very different approach between crime and care to the rules of evidence. Um, the roles of experts, this is something which is of crucial importance in um, both the criminal courts and the family courts. Um, Joe's experience in particular has been that in the criminal courts, because it's the CPS generally or the defence that are instructing experts, they're instructed by one side or the other. In the family court, a lot of experts are instructed jointly, um, partly for resource reasons. Um, but also in the family court, the um, experts have gotten over the years, medical experts we're talking about mainly, have been treated or felt that they weren't treated very well. And, and it's right that sometimes barristers um, are, and, and judges aren't very nice to experts. And I think in the, at the end, the very best experts can make an awful lot more money in their clinics than they can going to court and getting a very hard time from lawyers. Um, but they're absolutely crucial when it comes to medical evidence. And, and Jo will talk to you in detail about a case that she was involved in. in uh, it was a criminal court, in, um, criminal case in the Old Bailey for young parents who were accused of um, killing their young baby and then had their second baby taken away. And in the end, it was through medical evidence that it was demonstrated that actually they hadn't done what it was said they had been, uh, had been done. So this poor mother, who was, I think, only 19 when she had the first baby, it turned out eventually after two years, she hadn't done anything wrong. She had a serious vitamin D deficiency, which had led to rickets in the baby, which in turn had led to his death. So instead of being able to grieve for that baby and carry on with her life, she faced the most terrible ordeal of going through the criminal court. And uh, in due course, when she became pregnant with the, uh, another baby, in the course of that two years, um, that baby was taken away from her in the prison and she wasn't allowed to hold it or do anything with it, even though, as it later turned out, she hadn't done anything wrong. And it was medical evidence in that case that showed that it was her vitamin D deficiency that led to rickets in the child that led to his death. But for years, um, if there was this, uh, and Joe will talk to you in detail about it, a triad of injuries in a baby that was dead or very seriously injured, um, it was assumed that it was a shaking injury and therefore the babies were removed 
I'm sure you, you or a lot of you will remember there was a solicitor, Sally, somebody, I can't remember her surname. Oh. Clark, thank you. Um, and she was one of the victims of that. She hadn't, in the end, done anything. I think that was sudden infant um, death. Uh, she lost a lot of babies, and in the end, she was cleared, but um, too late, um, as, it, as it turned out. So without expert evidence, we wouldn't ever get to the bottom of these things, and that's why they play such a crucial role, both in the criminal court and in the family court. Um, and with that, the young couple um, who Joe, I think, represented the mother in, in the case I was just talking about, the Ricketts case, um, she, they first had to face the Old Bailey high standard of proof, uh, and uh, sorry, high um, the ninety nine percent standard of proof in the Old Bailey. They were acquitted there because there was such a, um, a difference of opinion in the medical expert. But then that wasn't the end of it because the new baby was in care proceedings with the much lower standard of proof. So the local authority took the case against the parents in relation to the second child and then they had to go through the whole thing again. And in the end, um, the High Court judge who heard it said it, it was Ricketts, that's what did it. Um, and they eventually got their second child back. But it's only through very determined legal representatives and, for, and a lot of medical evidence and people willing to speak out. They're absolutely of crucial importance in both uh, criminal justice and uh, family justice. And in that case, thank goodness they did. Um, is there a right to silence? Um, in the criminal court, yes, there is. A defendant doesn't have to say anything, but if they don't, I'm sure you've heard it in police dramas loads of times, uh, when you're arrested, you've got the right not to say anything, but if you don't, we'll hold it against you later, yeah, to paraphrase. And it's the, the same in um, the criminal court. If you don't give evidence, you don't have to give evidence, but an inference can be drawn of um, guilt. In the family court, you don't have that option. You do have to give evidence. You don't have a right not to give evidence as a parent who's accused. You don't have a right to refuse to answer questions. You have to answer the questions that are asked. And um, they, there is some, the, the reasoning behind it in the family court is that although the stakes are high, you might lose your child, the um, honesty is considered the most important thing for the protection of the child. And there is offered a protection to the parent in that they are not the evidence they give isn't supposed to be used um, in a criminal case. Uh, increasingly, we find in the family courts the police making applications for transcripts of the evidence given in the family court. And it, the, the current state of the law is that the police can use it for investigative purposes, but they can't use it, for example, to cross-examine in a criminal trial. But it's. Um, Parents do uh, try to avoid answering questions if they have pending criminal uh, proceedings against them, uh, but they're not allowed to and will be held in contempt of court if they don't answer questions when directed to by a judge in the family court. Um, Timescale, um, as uh, Joe says, in crime, it's how long is a piece of string because the cr criminal courts are renowned for their um, particularly... Actually, no, that's not fair. I was going to say defence um, barristers, but it's both sides, CPS and defence, applying for adjournments on the first day of the trial and then getting it for whatever reason and it falling out, the trial falling out, and it can be months or sometimes years before a trial comes on for hearing. Whereas in the family court, um, there is a new approach to care proceedings, which is that they're to be done in 26 weeks which for anybody who practices in these cases was an incredibly, it was almost impossible to imagine that you could finish care proceedings in six months because it takes a long time to first of all get the evidence together to look at what you're dealing with in terms of everybody knowing in a statement form what it is that happened at the beginning or in the past and it's a lot of digging up information. It sometimes can be four or six weeks before you get the bottom line facts or alleged facts and then you're looking at trying to get experts on board or for example um, in addiction cases where you have say an, a, a mother who's a heroin addict and the child is taken the care proceedings in relation to that child very often very often or at least sometimes an, a psychiatrist who sees the mother will say look she's got she really wants to change I think if I can get her into a rehab program she'd be she should be able to parent this child. But with addiction cases, 
usually you need to be abstinent for a year before anyone will say you can have the child back. So you can see immediately 26 weeks is a difficulty for a, a mother like that. And the stakes, again, are very high. If you have a five-year-old child with a strong bond to the mother, um, she's, the chances are the child's going to get adopted or long-term care because if you've got to finish it in six months, um, it's not giving you any time to play with and no time for a parent to demonstrate that they can change. But that's the way it is now um, under the 26-week rule. There are exceptions, and in the handout, Joe um, refers you to a case from the, the president where he said um, there must be exceptions to this. Uh, and I know I've been involved in a case recently that was a year, and, a year, a year, 16 months long, and it was a case where we just had to, we had to wait for the outcome of a criminal trial, and it was a, um, a mother accused of taking her children to become suicide bombers in Syria. And it took a long time for the criminal case to happen, and the family case, lots of children, different ages, um, family judge didn't want to go ahead until we had the criminal trial and then we had to get separate facts found on a different standard, the lower standard in the um, family court and then there was a big investigation, what do we do about it? Because it's one of these new areas of um, family law which we're all trying to figure out what to do because it, it's a very difficult question if you have a 12 or 14 year old who is radicalised and is uh, an ISIL supporter and is living in London and born in London or Birmingham or wherever. Um, what do you do if you remove them from their family, you risk radicalising them further. If you put them back with their family, you risk radicalising them further. And it's a real issue for the family courts at the moment. What do you do with these children? So a lot of assessment is needed from experts who are feeling their own way because it's such a new area. But that case, is not quite finished, and I think it's 16 months since it started. So that is an exceptional case, and I think the president would accept um, that those ones are, are, are exceptional. But in a way, if you're involved in a care case, I'm sure you as a parent feel every case is exceptional because it's so important to you. But in terms of the rules, generally care cases have to finish within 26 weeks. And the reason for it is that delay is considered against um, the children's interests, and generally that's true, because as a child is growing up, we know developmentally the sooner they're settled with a family, the more likely they are to make a good go of their lives, basically. So if you can place a child before the... If you only find out that a child is having difficulty in the way they're being cared for, if you find that out when they're three, it's crucial, really, that you get the child placed as soon as possible, and certainly before they um, go to school because they've got a much better chance of a good outcome if you do that. So we know from psychiatric evidence and psychological evidence over lots of years that delay is bad for a child and the sooner you can give them a permanent placement and stability, uh, the better. Um, this case was in the uh, news um, quite recently, a judge in the High Court was how we all first heard about it, Poppy Worthington. Um, it got a lot of press coverage um, looking at, and, and it's a good illustration of the difference in approach between the criminal court and, uh, or the criminal proceedings and um, family uh, courts. So what happened in this, this case of Poppy Worthington is there actually was no criminal case because the police messed it up so badly at the investigation stage that in the very end, not that I want to give away the end, but at the very end it was decided, I think in November just gone, um, in relation to a December 2012 death of a child, that there would be no criminal prosecution uh, because they didn't think they'd get a, a conviction that far down the line. But what happened in that case was the poppy died in December 2012. She was um, buried February 2013 after an initial um, uh, um, autopsy. June 2013, there was a post-mortem report. And then August 2013, that many months after she died, both of her parents were arrested. And then what was kept secret but was happening in the family court, in the high court, was that Mr Justice Peter Jackson had a fact-finding case and he delivered it only to the parties and didn't let it be published at that stage because there was a risk that if there was a criminal trial, there would be prejudice to the criminal trial, so he kept it um, completely uh, uh, private. Then in June 2014, the police 
service referred themselves to the um, Police Complaints Commission because they realised that they had messed up very badly. And then in October 14, um, the death was um, declared as being unexplained, which usually means somebody needs to look into this further, whether it's a coroner, family court or criminal court. January 2015, there was a request from the media for a fresh inquest because they got hold of this and didn't like the look of it. And in March 2015, so we're talking quite a long time after the death, the police decided that they weren't going to charge. April 15, there was a publication of the um, fact-finding judgment was held on to. And then in July 15, the media having asked the High Court to look again at the um, coroner's decision to leave things alone, um, the High Court said there has to be a fresh inquest to try and see what happened to Poppy. And then um, in January of last year, we heard that um, Mr Justice Peter Jackson um, had found that what, what killed Poppy was a sexual assault. And she was only a tiny little girl, but it was her... Um, he made a finding, having heard from the parents, that it was um, her father who had um, seriously sexually assaulted her um, the, night, the night that she died. She was found in the cot. The father found her and said that he couldn't understand it. She, she wasn't breathing properly and various other symptoms that showed she was very um, distressed. And she had an enormously damaged anus, which the police hadn't looked at properly and hadn't investigated. And so Peter Jackson looked at it and said, clearly, this is what happened. And it led directly to her death. Looking at the medical evidence, it wasn't just factual. He looked at it properly in the family court and found um, that um, it was he who had killed her. But then, as I started by saying, there was a decision by the police that they couldn't get a conviction even though the High Court judge had found that he did it. So in terms of how can that be, a High Court judge finds that the father killed her as a result of the sexual assault, and how come then that the police aren't going to prosecute? Well, they had screwed up so badly that on the higher standard of proof, beyond a reasonable doubt, the CPS didn't believe that they'd get the conviction and they're not allowed, not supposed to take proceedings or, ch or um, prosecute somebody in the courts unless they have a reasonable prospect of success. And because it was so far down the line, because there had been so much, um, I, I presume but don't know, there had been so much publicity um, that he would have been able to argue that he couldn't get a fair trial because the High Court judge had already published the fact-finding judgment. I imagine that that was part of the reason. So that's a, a very good ex example of where um, the standard of proof at the family court being lower doesn't make it any less of a fact because for the purposes of the family court that is what happened there never was a criminal case but it would have been a different standard of proof had it um, gone to the um, criminal court um, mr Justice peter jackson's it's on um, the internet you can look at it if you are interested but he, he absolutely it doesn't hold back on saying how disgraceful it was that the police messed it up so badly and he is he's a very brave judge even by high court judge standards and they deal with the worst of cases the very most serious cases he's a very um a very uh, brave and um thorough and intellectually rigorous judge and i uh, i would say um uh, if he says it happened um, he didn't say, it didn't say that uh, lightly. Um, uh, the other case that I mentioned that um, Joe will talk to you in detail about is the, uh, she calls it the Al Alas case because that was her client, the mother, and it's the one, the, the young mother, um, the baby who died when he was four months old, Jaden Ray. Um, she'll talk to you in much more detail about that, but I think I've probably um, given you enough of a flavour of what happened in um, that case. Um, this is another one then, Kai Kerr. This is an example of, um, you can just see on, in bare facts, um, he's a little boy, six weeks old, and he died, catastrophic head injury, um, 
couldn't say what had caused the death. So they know medically what caused the death, but they can't say for sure what, the, uh, what caused that medical condition. So he dies in July 2011, and then September 2013, the parents were arrested. Care proceedings, and there was a finding that he um, had caused Kai's death. And March 2015, so nearly two years later, he's charged with manslaughter. November 2015, he's acquitted. So there you have a direct, um, well, it's an illustration of the two different standards of proof, but it's also an illustration, perhaps, of the difference between the approach of a jury and the approach of um, a judge in terms of uh, different outcomes. But it is a very good example of the different standards of proof where, beyond a reasonable doubt, the jury thought he didn't do it. Whereas, as a matter of fact, looking at the interests of the other children in the house, the judge said he did do it. Uh, that's a, um, a, a summary of what happened in um, the, uh, the Guardian. So, um, I'm not going to go through Jaden Ray. I already gave you um, an example of that. Another, um, well, actually, there are lots of examples which I don't think you'll be assisted by. So instead, if there are questions at this stage, I think it probably might be um, a better use of the remaining 10 minutes or so that we have. <laughs> 